Okay, so thank you very much for the introduction. And so, yeah, I'm very excited to actually give this talk on the subject before an audience for experts on, in Polariton. I mean, as, as I go along, I, I can explain you where my interest on this topic was really coming from. And I'm actually very much looking forward to, uh, you know, get feedback from you on the way to approach this pro very interesting problem. So, yeah, so I'm going to talk about the, uh, this issue of symmetry and topology of, of the uh, polariton condensate in uh, Dirac material. I mean, this is not, this is a project I have done in collaboration with uh, my friends in uh, Seoul National University, although uh, the person who actually did much of the calculation, much of the work. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Or otherwise you can take the step and you have to go there because the camera is there. So. Okay, so who did much of the work? Uh, Ehun Lee is now faculty at uh, International University. So this is the work we have done and actually it, it yeah, I mean, it, it is some years since this work has been published. For instance, yeah, this this little young man was not around when we actually wrote uh, worked on the paper. Yeah, this is my son. He's about to turn four next month. Anyway, but he was not around when this work was published. But ever since he came along, I, I did notice that this, there, there has been actually experiment a related experiment actually done by people who are actually here for this workshop. So I'm actually going to comment on this uh, paper as well, how they how this may relate to or may not relate to what we have done. But I mean this although I said there are materials, this we, we had a specific material in our mind. So we, we need to explain to you what this material is all about. So this, the material we had in mind was the transition metal uh, dichalcogenide. And, you know, our approach is not really try to work out all the, you know, band structure details, but we were just trying to take into account the simplest basic, you know, characteristic of the band structure. So what we had in mind is that, you know, the Particularly, the parameters we have used for the calculation was this uh, molybdenum disulfide, and in in this in this particular material and other related material, the really the most relevant characteristic we had in mind is that this is an insulator with direct band gap, and also it had, uh, which means that we can, if you want to talk about the low energy physics. We can actually just focus on the those points in Berlin zone where uh, where we had the direct band gap. So we can just focus on just few, very few points. In this, in our case, actually two because of the this uh, crystalline structures, and just you know basically not really care about the rest of the Berlin zone like the gamma point. And also we have broken inversion symmetry there, and hence the strong spin orbit coupling effect. So this is an illustration of uh, this type of material. And what we have here is that, uh, yeah, basically this direct band gap gives us this kind of uh, massive Dirac Hamiltonian at this uh, K point and K prime point. And also the spin degeneracy in, at, the, the, at this, K and K, K prime is removed for the, yeah, just for the, this, uh, yeah, just for the valence band uh, due to this uh, atomic spin order coupling. So basically, you know, uh, 
yeah, it actually removed some electrons from the, uh, yeah, if we have a barely selective way of uh, removing uh, electrons from the valence band at the, uh, with the lowest energy cost, it turns, uh, what this implies that we, we are actually going to end up having spin polarization. And actually there's tool to do that and that's, that'll be very crucial to what I'll, I'll be talking about. And the, also another very, very uh, relevant, uh, I mean, the key aspect of the Dirac Hamiltonian that uh, will be coming back, back repeatedly is the fact that this is actually, this, this is giving us the very phase. And I mean, this is a very important issue because nowadays, because this concept of adiabatic transport, which means that we are having a transport through the ground state rather than through the excited state we have for the conventional metal, means that we can actually have transport without dissipation. And because of this aspect, this I mean, this has actually been a very strong motivation, although I have to add the fact that when the first person to actually think about this concept of adiabatic process, I mean, it's, it's actually a movie these days. There's Robert, uh, Max Born and Robert Oppenheimer. He didn't really seem to have really related this adiabatic process with the adiabatic, uh, trans, any, anything in transport at all. I mean, he, his work really dates from like, uh, way before World War II long before any, any of the event in this movie actually took place. But anyway, in recent, so this idea has been revived on almost a, after a generation in optics. And it's it's it actually got elevated to general principles of physics only by uh, mid eighties by people like Barry, Taurus and so on. And actually this has evolved into, this became actually a key feature in study of topological materials in recent years. So in materials like quantum anomalous hole, quantum spin hole, topological insulator, and various types of topological semi-metals as well. And basically, I mean, very phase is one very key feature in, in discussing any of these uh, topological uh, phases, yeah, topological state of matter. And in case of the uh, Dirac materials we are going to talk about, the interesting feature I'm going to talk about is that these are all basically at the band structure level, but here we are going to actually talk about uh, effect of electron-electron interaction, uh, which means the Coulomb interaction and the uh, electron-photon coupling. And it turns out that there is, there is actually competition between in this Coulomb interaction and electron-photon coupling. And this competition arises largely due to the, the, this uh, pi very phase. So basically, the, I mean, since we are talking about uh, exciton polariton condensate, we're obviously going beyond uh, the band structure for these materials. And it's also, I mean, Obviously, the way we go, the way we go beyond the uh, band structure is through the electron-photon coupling, of course. But also, I mean, these excitons have binding energy coming from Coulomb interactions. So there's we also need to take into account electron-electron interaction as well. But then, you know, the elect both electron-photon coupling and like, and even the electron-electron interaction, they actually can be can have, uh, they, they can be affected by the pi very phase on one hand, but on the other hand, actually when we end up with a uh, mean field, typical mean field Hamiltonian for the, uh, the these kind of exciton polariton condensate, we can also find the fact that this mean field Hamiltonian actually may, is not guaranteed to have the same type of very phase that the original band structure had. And in fact, because we are actually taking into account two different independent aspects, electron-photon coupling and the Coulomb interaction, 
actually there can be the fact this combination alone actually what I'm going to tell you here is that actually this can give rise to uh, symmetry breaking as well. Yeah, so yeah, so I mean that's because electron photon uh, coupling in the Coulomb interaction actually gives us competing exciton pairing symmetry. So let's see how this comes about. And you know, my actually main field of study is the uh, theoretical study of topological superconductor. And you know, kind of beginning point for this uh, field was when you know people start start to think about the pyro p-wave superconductor, where actually the very phase on. I mean, you st you start with a completely trivial band structure, but because of this. Uh, chiral p-wave pairing, you actually end up with uh, the two pi uh, phase binding, yeah, for the positive uh, chemical potential in the, in the case of positive chemical potential. So this kind, this here, you know, non-trivial topology arises entirely because of the, uh, I, I mean, non-trivial non topology arises only in uh, presence of this, uh, Unconventional, uh, this particular Cooper pairing. On the other hand, when people start to talk about the uh, topological superconductivity on surface of topological insulator, really the pi berry phase came, uh, I mean, the berry phase really came from completely different source. The band structure really had a, this direct Hamiltonian on the uh, TI surface actually supplied all the uh, necessary berry phase, whereas the Cooper pairing itself was completely conventional S-wave type of pairing, which would not have given, given us any kind of non-trivial topology for conventional band structure. So in here, what you can actually say is that you can actually have understand this pi berry phase easily by saying that the the yeah, the spin one half actually winds around the Fermi surface by two pi, and that's that actually because of the spin one half ends up giving us the pi berry phase. But it turns out that whether this uh, phase is really coming from the uh, berry phase or the pairing symmetry, the effect uh, topologically, the superconductivity has been the same. So people start to actually explore, I mean, uh, this many diff uh, other different sources of this pi bear, uh, pi bear phase, and one material people start to look look into is uh, the transition metal dicyclotenide. And one the simplest idea is to have Cooper pairing uh, intra valley Cooper pairings, and in this case it works out pretty much same as the uh, topological insulator surface, and actually the so this kind of superconductivity in transition metal dicyclotenide has already been uh, has been studied in uh, 2010s uh, in in the previous decade, and one aspect of this is that because we have this kind of intra uh, valley pairing, this is kind of like the FFLO pairing. It's not a pairing between. Uh, it's not Cooper, we are not having formation of Cooper pairs with net zero momentum. And because and, and therefore we are actually this this scenario would actually give us spatially modulated Cooper pairing. Yeah, so this actually raises this very interest, uh, interesting idea because if we are having formation not of Cooper pairs, really? but rather of excitons at each valley through the in, in, intra valley transition you know then in that case because hole and uh, electrons that i mean of course the you you might actually raise this question the valence and the conduction band would have opposite very phase a uh, very phase of opposite sign but that's not a big concern because uh that's that's easily reversed by the fact that you know holes and electrons would have different opposite uh, berry phase as well. 
So the situation in that sense is completely same as the situation we have for the Hoopa pairs. On the other hand, yeah, basically because we are having electrons and holes mm -hmm. rather than electron and electron, this issue of spatial modulation does not come mm -hmm. out. I, I mean, the this kind of intra intramalley exciton does not give us the issue of this uh, spatial modulation. And basically, if you are just thinking about exciton without any kind of input from photons, the really the source for binding these excitons needs to be uh, the Coulomb interaction. But the Coulomb interaction does not give us any kind of phase factor at all, as we all know. And because of that, if we write down these kind of excitons in, uh, in the band basis, it's, you know, we, we do end up with this kind of uh, chiral P wave phase factor coming up here. So what the bottom line here is that if we are forming excitons entirely out of uh, Coulomb interaction, we, we would actually end up having a chiral P wave excitons in this, uh, in this uh, materials like uh, molybdenum disulfide. On the other hand, we all know that if we are forming, forming out exciton polariton condensate, we cannot leave out electron photon coupling. And let's see what happens there. What happens there is that, you know, these electron photon coupling in this case is polarization, select, uh, I mean, it's fairly selective. If you're up using circularly polarized light, light, what you find is that, you know, the light circularly polarized light couples on, only to electrons at k point, whereas the left circularly polarized light couples only to k prime point. And the way, very simple way to understand this is that basic, this is because, you know, the very phase factor here actually can be canceled out by the circular polar. I mean, if you had the right, right correct circular, circular polarization, the very phase factor coming out from this, uh, having, uh, from this psi dagger C and psi, uh, psi dagger C psi V, V, can be canceled out by the correct uh, circular photon polarization. Yeah, and what this implies is that, you know, basically what happens is that if you are forming polariton entirely from uh, this kind of polariton exciton entirely from the uh, circular polarized light, light, light the exciton uh, Symmetry is going to be S wave. So basically, the you know, depending on the your exciton formation, uh, de depending on the mechanism of how you form your exciton, actually you're going to have different symmetry for your exciton in this material. Yeah. So this will basically this this is going to be the main you know starting point for uh, everything that follows. Uh, so because, yeah, what happens here is that because the uh, electron photon coupling gives us S wave exciton and this Coulomb interaction would give us this, effectively give us this chiral P wave exciton, they actually have different symmetry. And you, from this, there is a, actually competition between exciton formation from electron photon coupling and uh, Coulomb interaction. So we can actually know that you know if we have if they if in the extreme limit where electron photon coupling actually is actually dominates, then we are actually going to give us get, uh, end up getting getting what effectively S wave uh, exciton uh, exciton polariton. On the other hand, you know when the uh, Coulomb interaction becomes stronger and stronger. You know what? What we are going to show here is that uh, what a possibility that arises here is that, that there actually can be phase transition due to this uh, coming from this competition. And this is actually an idea that's in case of superconductivity, people have actually discussed a lot about competing pairing interaction. And what I was kind of uh, basic starting point for this work was that something similar actually can be done. Uh, can, can be actually 
considered for the case of X temporal tone. So we will actually going to show now talk about how we actually worked out the theory for this uh, problem. And, uh, you know, we have just review how we think about the polariton condensation in this uh, polariton condensation. Yeah, and I, I probably don't need to go too much into details here because this has been all discussed in the uh, very, very nice in the previous talk. Yeah, basically what, I mean, we are using Bragg mirror to, you know, hold our photons between, uh, hold our photons. And yeah, people have actually, uh, yeah, it, it has actually been quite a time since people have actually checked out the photon exciton hybridization for this in this uh, molybdenum disulfide. And what's, and also people are actually very, you know, Checking out this uh, badly polarized pol polaritone also has been done <coughs> in rather early years. Yeah, and now the point is about how we can think about the this uh, coherent ex exciton polariton condensate. And basically, this it's kind of, the wave function in some sense can be written as kind of like the product of the this uh, coherent product of this uh, wave function for the photons and laser, and also with the uh, exciton wave function, which is really in the kind of uh, form that's more popularly known from uh, BCS wave function for superconductors. Yeah, so in some sense, you know, we want to check, uh, we want to actually determine, I mean, depending on the uh, electron photon coupling and relative strength of the electron photon coupling in this uh, Coulomb interaction, we want to actually work out um, what kind of uh, lambda and U over V we are going to obtain for this wave function, ground state wave function. Yeah, and one other aspect we want to return to is that, yeah, basically if you want to really have this kind of condensation, you know, we do need, I, I mean, this is not really like the usual solar state system which can, which practically lives on forever. There is there is lifetime, uh, upper limit to lifetime coming from the cavity photon. And only, I mean, if you, the claim for the, any claim for condensation should be should actually require at least the photon lifetime be much longer than the uh, thermal radiation time. And you know now for how we actually did all the calculation is that we start out with Hamiltonian that contains the band structure, you know, photon energy, and in addition to the band structure photon energy, we put in uh, the Coulomb and both the Coulomb interaction and electron photon coupling. And we are basically uh, trying to do mean field calculation, which would give us this, uh, by which I mean that we want to do the variational calculation for this, this type of wave function and determine what lambda and V over V would actually minimize the energy of uh, the wave function in this form. Uh, energy expectation, value for the wave function in this form. And one feature we have put in here is that 
you know, we want to actually fix the total excitation density. Excitation by excitation, we mean combination of the photon number and the exciton number. And I have a question. Yes. Yeah. Like the mean field, you uh, consider the pumping? No. So you just like limit, like consider yourself that the total number of photon and exciton is constant. Like, yes. Yeah, so yeah, that's a very good question. And in reality, we can actually uh, make this non uh, yeah, we can put in loss or gain, and by which we can make the we can actually work from non Hermitian Hamiltonians. Yeah, that's yeah, thank you for the question. This, this, so when we are saying topology, we are only top, we are actually not including the non Hermitian topology here in this work. Yeah, so basically here, we want to actually apply uh, hartley path approximation to both electron-electron interaction and electron-photon coupling. And the way we do that is that we want to, uh, yeah, minimize the energy expectation value for this BCS-like wave function. And yeah, that condition actually gives us the way to actually work out all uh, the value for these various yeah, exciton pairing and also the photon, uh, photon density expectation value. And after this kind of process gives us this mean field Hamiltonian. And what we are going to do is to really look at the topology of this mean field Hamiltonian. And so the, all the talk about topology and symmetry was really based uh, what we mean is that what we are talking about is the symmetry and topology of this mean field Hamiltonian. And what we what we find is that, yeah, this was already indicated here, but basically when, when we did, uh, when we expand out the, uh, this our exciton exciton gap in terms of these uh, in terms of angular dependence, the two leading terms we we, have, we got is the S wave term and the P wave term, and it turned out the P wave term is gives us the as this chiral P wave uh, symmetry. Yeah, and so we can actually uh, think about what's really going on here. And basically, you know, the if we just look at the uh, S wave X tone, this uh, in, in going from the original band, uh, the mean field Hamiltonian is never going to close the, uh, close the energy gap at all. So basically, what this means is that uh, this is this is trivial in the sense that it's not going, it's not changing any val the very phase at all from the uh, non-interacting Hamiltonian. On the other hand, the gap closing is possible with a uh, P wave uh, exciton, and that's because P wave exciton by definition cannot gap out k equals zero. So at some point you can actually close out the gap at the k equals zero, and that actually means that you can actually have, uh, yeah, changing your very uh, your very phase with the p wave pairing. Yeah, but if you have combination of the s wave pairing and p wave pairing, it turns out that you can actually uh, you are actually going to have the gap. You can actually have the gap closing away from k equals zero. So in this sense, you're actually breaking the, uh, this is actually means that this combination of S and P is really going to break, uh, is actually breaking additional symmetry. Yeah, so we know that if we have combination of this kind of, uh, this S wave and P wave, P wave, we are actually breaking rotational symmetry. So in this sense, we are actually ha having two different 
uh, symmetry. Uh, in some sense, we are actually having, you know, both symmetry breaking transition and topological page transition as well. So now we can actually present the result on how this mean field Hamiltonian gives us uh, the result of this uh, effect of this composition. So here is the basic number we use for our calculation, mean field calculation. And we first look at, looked only at the uh, single valley. And this is the region where actually this kind of uh, very big change occurred. And we are just looking at this in terms of the detuning parameter, by which I mean the difference between the photon and single photon energy and the uh, energy gap. And this RS is the coming from the mean distance between, yeah, excitation, which which have, uh, by which I mean both photon and exciton. Yeah, so this non-trivial phase arises for occurs largely for positive detuning and hot and rather high excitation density, which means small RS. Yeah, and this is the, something that came out in the mean field calculation. <laughs> and we actually do have a region where actually the photon density go, goes down to zero. Find that region where photon density goes down to zero. But anyway, once we, and this is a plot we have worked out for the, uh, yeah, this, this is a plot we have worked out for, for this fixed, uh, detune, uh, fixed value of the detuning parameter and bearing only the excitation density. And what we see is that, yeah, uh, as we see, um, when photon density starts to come down, at some point, what actually happens is that P-wave exciton from, uh, from the Coulomb interaction actually starts to dominate over the uh, S-wave exciton coming only from the uh, electron photon coupling. And that gives us this kind of non-trivial uh, non uh, phase. And what we see here is that basically in, in terms of like the, yeah, skirmian like te uh, texture we often use for discussing topological superconductivity, it turns out the phase binding actually goes, occurs in the region, uh, needs to occur inside this kind of red region to really have uh, topological non-trivial phase. And what we see is that this, originally occurred outside, but at some point it goes inside and then outside again. And yeah, the condition for ha having this kind of C or D is to have larger P wave pairing than uh, P wave exciton strength than the S wave, S wave exciton. This is our main picture. And once we put in both values, something, some additional terms occur because near this, uh, tri uh, trivial to non-trivial uh, transition point for single valley, what we start to have here is that additionally, we start to have uh, valley symmetry breaking as spontaneous valley symmetry breaking as well. So it's, it's like we have uh, dominant P wave in one valley and dominant S wave in the other valley. And what's, what's interesting about that, this point is that they, we, we said chiral P wave pairing, but actually because this chiral P wave is really coming from the Berry phase, and we all know that K and K prime has opposite Berry phase sign. And that mean, that gets in, uh, that comes over to this particular chiral P wave pairing as well. So what happens is that if we had the chiral P wave pairing for, uh, you know, both, both values, actually the very phase sign reversal also gets canceled out. So we don't really have any kind of net very phase effect for the whole system. 
On the other hand, once the belly, uh, belly symmetry breaking occurs, you cannot have this kind of translation anymore. So what we have here basically here is that, uh, yeah, so the valley, this kind of valley polarization actually can give us that, uh, that quantum, uh, what, what can be considered as the quantum anomalous hole coming from the uh, external polarizing condensation. But once the uh, both values becomes non-trivial, what we get is an analog of, analog of uh, quantum spin hole, mainly because the spin order coupling has opposite sign for the two values. Yeah, so after this work came out and my son came along, I, I mean, this is a work done by uh, people who are, are here for the workshop. And I mean, so it turns out the very close, very closely related, I and mean, for very closely related, uh, more than diselenide, that uh, this external polarizing condensation has been observed. And it's largely following the similar. Uh, uh, condensation pro uh, process I have uh, discussed in this talk, and you know I I don't think the looking for any kind of topological. Uh, I'm not sure what what's the what was the inter internal discussion, but I understand that this paper was not really discussing about topological phase of the exotomolarton condensate, but it did point out on reading this paper. We I mean you you can see that it's actually it does bring in new factors that we were not really discussing in our paper, such as the finite polariton lifetime, which may be also important for, you know, probably thinking about the non-hermission possibility of fade condition due to non-hermission, uh, ha having non-hermission uh, system. And also another interesting thing was that it turned out they, they it seems that uh, this paper is showing how you can actually induce condensate value polarization using magnetic field. And that may be another uh, interesting way to induce uh, phase transition in this uh, extempolarton condensate in the system. And so here are my conclusions and thank you very much for your attention. Many thanks. Yeah. Thank you for your talk. I'm actually a little bit confused by the pipeline how all it develops because you start with uh, electrons from all species and very phase in the materials. Then you talk about superconductivity. Okay, we say follow, you have different values, you can think of intra valley, inter valley, in principle, it depends on the different parameters. But then you switch to exitons and you talk about very phases in different directions. I always start to lose connection a little bit because, uh, okay, I can understand that. There you can have some very phase inherited from electrons and balls, and here they compensated. But how do you connect this? And then how do you come to polarities from there? Do you mean that you pump these excitons and then you couple them with light? So I'm a little bit confused by the line of your research. Oh, I, well, I, I'm. What I'm saying is that if you're forming excitons through this direct gap, basically the pairings, uh, I mean, kind of very phase you're going to encounter there, it would be the same, exactly same as the intra valley Cooper pairing. That's that's the answer for the first question. And the second question is, I mean, but you can, this this is, if you're really treating uh, excitons and Cooper pairs on the same footing, that, that's kind of like saying that you're only considering exciton formation through electron-electron uh, interaction. But if you're pumping in light, and actually coupling the electrons to photon condensate, basically you also need to think about the exciton formation through uh, electron photon coupling. And electron photon coupling, exciton photon coupling, I can understand. What is similar between uh, Cooper pairs formation and exciton formation? So you mean this? Well, you're binding electron. either you're binding two electrons. Or you're binding electron and hole. Binding to electrons is usually due to phonons, for example. Binding electron hole is bipolar interaction, which is quite direct. 
Yeah. Providing electrons, we don't even, even have electron charge in this form. So, okay, they're all of, of electric nature, but I don't see clear connection with this process. I can just miss it. Well, in both cases, we are actually talking about, yeah, binding energy of the, I mean, we are talk, thinking about binding energy both for, I, I mean, in superconductivity, we always say, talk about pairing gap, that is to say, binding energy between Cooper pairs. But I mean, if you basically, the, at least in the mean field, uh, from, from a, uh, you can also think about a similar binding energy for the uh, exciton as well. And moreover, we are talking about condensate. Just as we are in mean, superconductivity is arising from the Cooper pair condensation, uh, we are talking about the, in, when we say exciton polariton co condensate, there it requires kind of clearance between excitons as well. So okay. I'm just, just trying to make the same analogy and Really, the wave function was supposed to, I mean, intended to indicate that as well. I mean, you know, this. I mean, this this wave function. If you just irradiate out the photon part and change side dagger side to side dagger side dagger, that's just exactly the BCS wave function. So, from the mean field perspective, the Hamiltonian's the direction of the receiver. Yes. So what would be experimental signatures you would recommend to look at? I mean, for seeing any effects which you find interesting in the polarity condensate, you mentioned magnetic field measurements have been performed and so on. Uh, would you look at different valleys, polarization or? Well, I mean, the easiest, Answer from my viewpoint would be to say that, you know, you can, uh, yeah, the, this, you may have a uh, chiral edge state arising out from the valley polarization. That, that would be, I mean, that would be one one consequence for uh, let me see that. Yeah, I and mean, one consequence for this valid polarized phase would be the since this is some analog of the quantum anomalous holes state, you would have the uh, chiral edge edge, uh, edge quality particles along the uh, but. Yeah, I mean, this is exciton polariton. So it's, since you're not thinking about this, any kind of transport signature, I'm not, can't think off my head what was like the optical signature for this kind of chiral edge, ex, gapless chiral edge excitation. But I mean, that, that's something, yeah. So I, I would have to think more about it, but that, that'll be one physics one can look for. I, I'm sure that you can, there's a way to figure out optical signature as well. Um, and in theory, you put H0 as a band structure, right? And, yes. Uh, can you contrast also what you would expect for, a, let's say, trivial band structure versus a topological band structure? Because excitons have been observed in topological material also just recently. This machine, for instance, is a topological insulator, and people have observed um, excitons therein. So what would I expect here versus a trivial band structure? Is there any signature? Can you comment oh. on that? Yeah. Basically, this kind of competition between the exciton uh, formation through photon coupling and exciton formation just from the Coulomb interaction it really requires the pi wave phase, and if pi wave phase is not, it's not there, you wouldn't have this kind of competition at all. Basically, it would be all that way. So, the, yeah. More questions? Oh, so many more. <laughs> okay, it's these two, okay? That's it then. So, you mentioned chiral edge. These are the actual particles.
Can you speak up a bit? It's oh, okay. well, you can almost not hear you. So uh, you mentioned about using higher edge state signatures, but these are usually uh, open system is not very well defined boundaries. So it's, uh, is there any like signature that Yeah, I agree that this it's not it's very different from you know pure electronic system. And on the other hand, since you're there are so many ways to nice ways to manipulate the system optically. I mean, just if we really understand this better, maybe there's it's easier to detect chiral edge state than in the yeah usual quantum on almost all states. But yeah, if that's I think that will be an interesting issue to think about. I agree okay. that that will be an interesting issue to think about. There was one more question. Uh, can you go to the table that you summarize your church number? So basically, uh, I have a question is that uh, in B and D, uh, Knows that we do not break time reversal symmetry. So how how come the total check number is non-zero? So oh, you are breaking time. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, you apply some magnetic field there or not? Because like by symmetry. No, uh, you are breaking symmetry display. No, the circular I mean, mm -hmm. you're having net circular polarization of photons. So, so you are you are breaking so, so it's time versus symmetry. So time versus symmetry yeah. because you have photons. Yeah. Okay. Hey, thanks, speaker, once again.